Hello. Okay. People are entering. There's still a lot more people to come in. Uh, you should see the desktop. Um, still got a lot of people to come in yet. Okay. Okay. Is is the desktop visible? Can you hear me? Everything seem bright? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Um first there's a new programming assignment up. Now let me go ahead and okay, it's due uh a week from Tuesday, the twenty ninth. You know, not this coming Tuesday, a week from Tuesday, the 29th, okay? And there's this page, and there's a zip file over here, okay? And before talking more about this assignment, I want to go back, and well, the assignment is making use of string methods that were this sections here, 2.6 and 2.7. So it's an assignment about string methods, and we just started talking about string objects on, on last Tuesday. On Tuesday, we just started talking about string objects. So what we need to do now is finish talking about string objects, essentially finish sections 2.6 and 2.7 from this book, then go talk about the homework assignment, and then finish chapter two with this stuff. I'm sorry, and then finish chapter two so again, yeah, we're gonna finish talking about string objects, which is 2.6 and 2.7. Then today's reading assignment was 2.9 and 10, so we'll finish that. And we'll go talk about the homework assignment, okay? And then we'll be done with chapter two of this book. And you know, th this and chapter four, the other book, are about strings and about methods and objects. So we'll be done with the stuff about methods and objects. So your reading assignment for next week is a new topic. So that's starting a new topic on uh, conditionals and logic. Okay, so today we'll finish talking about strings and objects. I'm sorry, methods and objects. Strings an example, turtle, and turtles are an example of objects. So we're gonna finish talking about that. And then the reading for next week is to start a new, a new topic. Okay, so let's go and finish we, yeah, we just started talking about string objects at the end of class the other day. We only did this little example. We created a string and we created a string. It, we, you have two ways of creating a string. You can actually say new string and then give it the string or you can just type the string. You know, with turtles, you have to say new turtle. With strings to create a string object, you don't have to say new string. You can just type the string itself directly. Okay. And then we gave a name to the hello string. So this, notice we have one, two, three string variables so far, but we only have two string objects. And then we made one of the string objects become uppercase. And we, we talked about what this did. So if we visualize this, remember, we create a string variable pointing at a string object. So the object's not the variable. They're not the same thing. The variable isn't really the object. The variable points at the object. Then we created another string variable, S2, pointing at a different string. Then this was the tricky part. This does not create a new string. It creates a new string variable that ends up pointing at the string hello. So we don't have one, two, three strings. We only have one, two strings. You can see them here. This built a string and this built a string. These are not the strings. The variables aren't the strings. The variables are just names for the strings. So one string's got two names, okay? Now, then we talked about the other day on Tuesday about how complicated this line is here, line eight. When you tell 
S1 dot hello, when you tell this string to make himself uppercase, that string doesn't change himself like turtles do. Turtles modify themselves when you set when you call methods on them. When you call a method on a string, it does not modify itself. Remember what it does is it builds a copy of itself. And Let me just show you. I, we had uh, go back over here. Here's the code. Where I'll open the code in a separate window. There's the code, and then there was the picture. Well, oh, I didn't draw a picture for this. Well, oh, um, oh, did I forget to put the picture? We, we drew a picture. I th let me check that. I think I thought we drew a picture. Maybe I forgot to put it up on the course website. No, we didn't draw a picture. Okay, the the thing what that was tricky was. When you get to this line of code, remember you create a anonymous string object over here, but then we're going to give it a name. But before we give it a name, this, this creates the anonymous string object over here. And we, yeah. And then after it's created the anonymous string object, then we give it that name S4. So the picture ends up looking like this. So this was created by this one. When we called two uppercase on him, he did not change himself. He doesn't change himself. He built a copy of himself with the change in the copy. And then that's an anonymous object, but then we went ahead and gave a name to this anonymous object. Okay, so we gave it a name, all right? And that's real careful. We have to be real careful about how that works. Unlike turtles, when you call methods on turtles, so if we go back to one of the turtle code, when you call a method on a turtle, you change the data in the turtle. When you call a method on a turtle, the turtle changes the data inside of himself. Okay, but strings never do that. Strings will never change the letters that are inside the string. Once you build a string, it stays fixed. It stay, It never changes what's inside of itself. So when you call a method on a string, the string makes a copy and puts the new data in the copy. Okay, so strings and turtles are, in a sense, two different kinds of objects in Java, two, two fundamentally different ways of behaving. Turtles are the more common kind of object. When you call a method on the object, the object changes what changes the data in itself. So you call a method on that object and it updates the data in the object. And that's true for all these turtle objects. Most objects in Java work that way. Strings are a little bit odd. Strings have the property that they never are allowed to change. Every time you ask a string to do something that would change it, the string gives you back a copy of itself with the changes in the copy, okay? Okay, so you have to be careful that if you don't do something like, if you just, unlike with turtles, if you do that and then print the string, you get a surprise. So you tell the string to uppercase itself, then you print out the string. And this surprises a lot of people. They get down here and the string didn't change because S1 did, you know, unlike a turtle, this did not change him. But what happened? Where did the, okay, here's a good question. Where did the capital hello go to? Where did 
capital H, capital E, capital L, capital L, capital O go to. It was created here. What happened? Does anybody see what kind of happened? This line created an object over here that held capital H, capital E, capital L, capital L, capital O. Why isn't that object showing up in the picture? It didn't have a string. It didn't have a, no, it, it is a string. It didn't have a what? A variable. A string variable. It didn't have a, a name. It didn't have a string variable pointing to it. If it doesn't have a variable pointing to it, it's not shown in this picture and it essentially disappears. So it is a string, but it didn't have a name given to it. Now, when I, when I go back to the way it was, I, I know that this creates a new string with the changes in it. So I have to create a new string variable to essentially catch that new string. And then what I wanna print is the new string variable. Okay, so then I go over here and I see, now I'm about to create that string with the capital H-E-L-L-O in it, but I'm going to make sure I give that thing a name. So I make sure to give it a name, a string variable name. So it is a string, but I have to make a name for it. And now I can print the, the new name. I can print it by its new name. Its old name is the, the, the S1 still prints it this other string. Very tricky. It's something that causes a lot of, uh, especially in early programming, until you get used to this, it causes a lot of confusion because strings act different than turtles. When you tell a turtle to turn left, the turtle changes his own data and he's now a turtle that's pointing in a different direction. When you tell a string to two uppercase itself, it doesn't really quite do that. It doesn't two uppercase itself. It gives you back a copy of itself with the uppercase letters in the copy. And you better capture a, a, a variable reference. You have to catch an arrow to that thing. Otherwise, it just disappears on you. Okay? If, you don't, if you don't save it in a variable, so to speak, if you don't save the new string in a variable, you lose it. Okay, so strings act differently than turtles. Turtles are the way most objects act in Java. Strings are the, the unusual ones, but we use strings a lot. So it's important to understand how strings are, are not changing themselves. They're creating copies of themselves and the changes are made in the copy, okay? Now, with the case of turtles, we saw that you could do a lot of things with a turtle. Make him move forward, make him turn left. He could raise his pen. You could put his pen back down, change the color of his pen. You know, you could turn, uh, besides turning left and right, you can turn an arbitrary angle. Okay, what are the things you could do to a string? How many different things can you do to a string? Okay, now in the reading assignment, there was this section on string methods. What are the methods we can call on a string? So let's look at some of them. Okay, so you could ask a string for how long it is. You could ask the string to give you substrings, sub pieces of it. We'll, we'll play with these examples in a minute. Okay, when you create a string, like this is the string, this is a test. Every letter in the string is given something called an index. This is the, well, this is the zero with letter in the string. You think of it as the first letter. But the way Java works, you count it as the zero with letter. And this is confusingly called the first letter in the string, but it's really the second one because we start counting at zero. Each letter has a number called its index. Each letter has an index in the string, including the space. Oops. Notice that there, there's a space here. It's counted. It's the fifth character in the string. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 is the 1, 2, 3, 4, fifth character in the string. There's another space and there's another space. All right, so you could ask for the index of something in the string. 
or you can ask for what's at a certain index. Okay, so now if you go, let me real quick go to the homework assignment. The homework assignment is about strings. In the homework assignment, I put a little table of methods that are in strings. That you, there, it's kind of helpful to have a little table that shows you what you can do. So here's some methods in the class string. If you open this, there's a little table. This is not all the methods in a string, but these are the ones you need for the first homework assignment. Like for example, care at lets you ask what's the character at an index. Let's see. Let's try it. Let's go ahead and, and do this. Okay. So let's go to our code. Okay. Let me go. Let me just play with hello here. Okay. So I have this string S1, and I can ask, what's the care at index three? Okay. Now that's going to give me index zero is H, index one is E, index two is L, index three is L. So that's going to tell me L. But notice I'm not keeping the answer. I'm not putting the answer in a variable. Now I could do two different things with that answer. I could print it. This is kind of the easy thing to do. Let me print that answer. Okay, so I run this. Okay, I'm about to ask S1, what's the care at index three? Yeah, and then I can go up here. I go S1 is this string, index zero, one, two, three. So I know it's going to be an L. And I click forward, see, and I printed L. Okay, so I could print the answer. But what if I wanted to remember the answer, not by printing it out, but I wanted to remember it in my program. Then I need a variable to hold the answer. So another thing I can do is I could create a variable, a care variable. See, I'm getting the care at. So Java has variables that are cares, and I'm gonna call this variable C, and I'm gonna store this answer in that variable. So instead of printing the answer, I'm going to store the answer in a variable. Well, actually, I'm doing both. I'm printing it and storing it. Right? So, so this line will print the answer. Now, this line is going to create a box, a variable over here to hold the answer. See? And notice that single quotes are used for single letters and double quotes are used for strings. Some, in Java, this is called a character variable, and it's allowed to hold only one single character. You can't put a string in it. You can't put two characters in it. You can only put one character in it. And when you hold one character, it's shown with a single quote. So that was the second L in hello. Now I could also go back here and ask, well, what's the care at Four. The care at four would be the O at the end of hello. That's the O at the end of hello. Okay. I could go ask for S4's care at four. Well, S4 was this other string. It's the two uppercase version of S1. If I ask S4, what's your care at four? I'll get a capital O in this case won't look a whole lot different. There's not a big difference between the uppercase. You, you can kind of, if you look at it carefully, you can kind of see that's a capital O, not a lowercase O. Okay, so that's this method, care at. Okay, um, let's go down here. Here's another, I can ask for the length of a string. Okay, so let's go over here and I could say s1.length. Now, same kind of thing. I'm going to get an answer. The length of S1 is one, two, three, four, five characters. What do I want to do with that answer? Well, usually there's you can do one of two things. You could store it, the answer somewhere, or you could just print it out. If you print it out, your program prints it and forgets it because it didn't store it anywhere. But you, know, you could print it or store it. I'm going to, I want to store it. 
So I need a variable and I'll call it n. It's an integer variable because it's counting length. So I'll store the answer in a variable. So I'm asking S1 what its length is and it tells me back an answer and I'm storing the answer in a variable. Okay, five letters in H-E-L-L-O. On the other hand, I could ask string S2 its length. So I could ask S2, what's your length? So I'm calling the same method, but on a different object. So I'm not changing what method I'm calling, but I'm changing what object I'm calling it on. So I get a different answer because S2 has a different length than S1. So run it, watch. Now I find out that there's six characters in goodbye. Okay. Now let's we'll see what's another method over here. Let me see. Here's one that's real useful index of. Okay. Index of lets me ask where in the string is this letter? Okay. So, for example, I can ask in S4, where is the index of the letter O? Okay, so I'm asking, I'm oh, not sorry, S4, I wanted to ask S2 that. Okay, I want to ask S2, where is there an O? in S2. Now there's actually two O's in S2. What it gives me is the first one. Okay, it gives me the, and that'll be index one. Okay, now I'm gonna put this in a variable so I can see what the answer is. I could print it if I wanted to, but I'd rather save the answer instead of printing it. So notice, here I asked S2 to tell me its length, and here I ask S2 to look inside of itself, find the index of an O. Okay, and I go down here, and I find out that it's index one. The first O in goodbye is index one. Okay, now what about the second O? Well, Java has a last index of method. Okay, so you can get the last index of something. So let me do something funny. Let me write a bunch of O's there. Okay, now I'm going to ask for the, whoops. Okay, well actually, I'll just reuse M. I'm going to store, and I'm going to change what's in M but I'm gonna ask it, what is the last index of O? Okay. If I count here, the first one, the first O is at zero, one. The last O is at zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, if I counted it right. The last O is at six. What I do wrong? Uh, oh, I forgot the dot after S2. Okay, I'm calling the last index of method on S2 and I forgot to type the dot there. Okay. Okay. Why did I get nine here? Oh, I'm sorry. Nine is, <laughs> I'm just reading. N is the length. Okay. There's nine characters in goodbye. M now holds the index of the first O. That's at one. The first O is at index zero, one. And the last index is at five. So that would have been zero, one, two, three, four, five. Five. The last index of a zero is five. Now those in between O's, you can't ask about them. There's only a, a, a method to find the first index and last index of something. 
a tricky thing is to find the indexes of in between ones. And well, as we play around, you see that you actually have to do something kind of hard. You have to remove the beginning of the word and just check what's left. So, so if you want to find out if there's other O's in something, like here, there's a you can, there's a first and a last. If you want to know if there's other ones, you have to start doing playing games with chopping this string up into pieces. So you have to kind of like remove the beginning of it so that you can ask if there are more O's in between. Okay, how can you chop a string up into pieces? Okay, that's a method over here called substring. You can ask for subparts of a string. Okay, now substring takes, there's uh, two versions of substring. See, there's substring, substring, there's two versions of it. One takes a number and one takes two numbers, start and end. Let's do this one. This one's a little bit easier to understand before we do that one. Here's what it's going to do. Substring is kind of like two uppercase. It's building a new string. So if I'm going to ask a, a string a question using substring, I want the answer. I need to build a new string variable to hold the answer. So I need a new variable to hold my answer. Then I'm going to ask S2 for a substring. Okay. Now what I'd say is I want the part of S2 that starts somewhere and ends somewhere. So I'll just pick I'll just pick a couple of numbers. I want to start at three and end at seven. Okay. So I want the substring that starts at three and ends at seven. Zero, one, two. So Three zero one two three. That's this O here. That's zero one two three. So I start at that O. Then I go three, four, five, six. That'll give me O O D. And a quirk of this is you don't include the number seven. This says stop one step before seven. Okay. They they chose to make this kind of funny. When you say I want the substring from three to zero. You start at index three, but you stop at index six. So that'll give me three, four, five, six. That'll give me O, 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 D. Okay, so let's check. So that should give me string five should be the string O, 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 D. Three, four, five, six, four letters in the substring. Okay, now I'm about to build string five. See? It's got O, 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 D. Okay, so that's substring. Now, it, it did not chop S2 into a substring. It gave me back a substring. S2 didn't change. You know, if this was a turtle-like thing, this would chop S2 into a smaller string. It would, it would chop it to a substring of itself, but that's not how strings work. If I ask S2 for a substring of himself, S2 chops the substring out of himself and makes a copy and gives me the copy. So there's the, so, so, and I better capture it with a variable. Otherwise, see, if I just do, if I, if I make a mistake and just say, and I think it's turtle-like, and I think, oh, I'm gonna, heck, I'm gonna get a substring of S2. This turns out not to really do anything. When I execute this, it's going to create a it's going to create a string out here, but nobody gives it a name, so the string actually just kind of disappears on us. The string was built and thrown away. It built the substring, and then we didn't give it a name, and we didn't print it. We didn't, didn't we did nothing with it. We didn't print it. We didn't save it, so it just disappears on us. It didn't modify S2 like a turtle would modify itself. This did not modify S2. So it's, strings are a little bit tricky. You have to, you have to remember to take to, uh, here, I have to make sure I capture what's in there. Now, there's another substring method. What does it do? Let's try it. It only takes one integer. I'll create another variable to hold another answer. So I'm gonna say S2 
two dot sub string. What happens if I just give it a one number, like say I'll give a number like six? Okay. What that does, it starts there and goes to the end. So if you don't give it a second number, see, start there and go to the number that's one less than this. This says start there and go to the end of the string. So that'll start at the, at the seventh letter of the string, because remember we start counting at zero. So that'll be zero, one, two, three, four, five. That'll be, there's the sixth letter of the string. Well, actually, it's the seventh letter of the string with index zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. I think it's that one. I, you know, it's hard to count these things, but that starts at the seventh letter of the string and goes to the end of the and goes to the end of the string. Okay, go over here. Okay, so I'm about to create my S six. Okay, and I get D B Y. The very last they get the last three letters of the string. Notice it didn't chop S two into anything. It gave me. Well, it chopped out of S2, but gave me the answer as a separate string, which I have to either print it or remember it. I either, I either better give it a name so I remember it, or if I, if I want, I could print it. But then if I print it, I don't have it in my program anymore. It's, you know, when you print it, it appears down here. It's not part of your program anymore. More often than not, you want to remember a variable. You want, you want your answers to be in variables which you can print if you want to, but then you have the, you've kept them for later use. So if you compute a substring, you probably want to save it. You might want to print it, but at least you save it so you can do anything you want with it. Okay. Now there's there's here, let's do another one. Here's an interesting one, trim. Let me go up here and play around a little bit. Let me change hello. Let me put some spaces at the beginning of hello and some spaces at the end of hello, okay? And then if I visualize this, notice that there's a bunch of spaces at the beginning and a bunch of spaces at the end, okay? That could be because just somehow the data was entered that way. But a lot of times when you have strings like this, you just want to get rid of the spaces at the beginning at the spaces at the end, and that's what the trim method does. The trim method return now read now what's now notice that they give you how you call the method what it gives you as an answer they give you an example of using it so if s is the string quote bunch of spaces java a bunch of spaces close quote when you trim it the answer just has java in it so they give you how to call it what it gives you back as an answer an example of using it and then an explanation so it returns a new string. This is what we've been emphasizing. It returns, it doesn't change the string you're calling it on. It gives you back a new string having the same characters as the original string, but with leading and trailing white spaces removed, okay? So we can do that over here. Down here, I can do a, I have to capture the answer in a new string. So S7, I'm gonna take S1 and trim it. So I tell S1 to trim itself, but S1 doesn't really trim itself. S1 gives me a copy of itself where the copy has been trimmed. And that's real important to keep, remember, I keep saying that over and over again. S1 doesn't really trim itself. It ne strings never change themselves. They always give you back copies where the change is made in the copy. Okay, so see there I'm about to trim S1. I'm about to create the variable S7 with the new answer in it. And there's the trimmed S1. Okay, so that's a real useful command. That's it's 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 real useful. A lot, a lot of times you get strings, and and for some reason or other, there's spaces at the beginning and spaces at the end, and this thing will just get rid of them for you. Okay. Um, there's some other things in here that you're not going to need for the whole homework assignment. You can compare two strings together, 
and it'll tell you which one would come first. And it, it well, we'll, we'll talk about this later, but it's used for putting word strings in alphabetical order. It, it'll tell you which string would come first in the dictionary. And it, and it does it in a funny way. Actually, let me just show you. It does it kind of a funny way. I'm going to create a couple of new strings. Cat. Dog. Okay, there's two words. Two strings. Okay. I'm going to compare. I'm going to say S8. Compare it. Now, notice it's called compare to. I want to compare to S9. Okay. Now, what kind of answer does it give me? Gives me an integer of all things. I'm not sure what, you know, what, what could it mean by an integer? So it's supposed to give me an answer. It's an int. So I'll say, okay, int, I'll come up with a name, A for answer equal. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to store the answer to see what it says. Okay. Then I put a semicolon at the end. Right. So visualize this to see what kind of answer I get. Okay. Create cat. Create dog. Now get this answer. Compare cat with dog. I got negative one. Okay. Now let me flip it over. Remember, it, it, I got negative. Well, actually, I'll fl I won't flip it over. I'll just do it again. I'm going to do int b equal s nine dot compare to. S8. I'm going to reverse the order of how I'm asking them. S8 compared to not S9 versus S9 compared to S8. Okay, the answer to the first is in A, the answer to the second one is in B. Go to the end because I wanted to see the answer. Negative one and one. What they're doing is that the what you don't really care is whether it's a positive or negative number. Okay, what did net what do you think negative meant here? Think of it. Cat dog. Which one comes first in the dictionary? Yeah. Cat. Cat, cat comes first. So this one's first in the dictionary. This one's second. So the negative one means that this one came before that one in the dictionary. The negative one tells you what order they're in. Now here they're reversed. This one is thou dog, it comes after that one, okay? And it gives me positive one. Here's what they're kind of doing. What they're really doing is something like numbers. They're really saying, if these were numbers, which one's larger, okay? So it's really doing something like S9 minus S8. This is, it's, it's a weird idea, and this is used a lot in programming. These aren't numbers, they're strings, but if you were to put them on a number line, dog would come after cat on a number line. Dog would come to the right of cat on a number line. And this is asking, oh, I'm sorry, it's asking S8 minus S9. It's asking this minus this. Okay, this is the larger number. When you subtract a larger number from a smaller number, what do you get? A negative you, number. Pardon me? A negative number. Negative number. See, when you subtract a larger number from a smaller number, you get a negative number. That's their logic here. Very strange logic. You think of these words as being like on a number line. Dog is to the right of cat on the number line. So dog is a larger number than cat on a number line. This is this number minus that number. You have a smaller number minus a larger number, so you get back a negative number. On the other hand, this one's acting like S9 minus S8. So this is acting like a 
larger number minus a smaller number because the dog comes comes farther to the right in the dictionary. It's farther in the dictionary than cat is. Larger number minus smaller number gives you larger number minus smaller number gives you positive. Very strange logic, but that's how pro, uh, almost all programming languages use this logic for comparing strings. When you compare strings, you get back an answer that's an integer. It's either positive or negative. And what they really are thinking is something like, you're putting these things on a number line and you're really asking which one's farther to the right on the number line. Is this one larger than this one or is this one smaller than this one? So you do something like subtraction and you get back either a negative or a positive number. Very quirky. Now let's see, let's read what they say. Compares this string, see, this string is compared to some other string, okay? Which comes first in lexical graph ordering, okay? Returns a negative integer if this string, this string is the one that's to the left of the dot returns a negative number if this string is first in the ordering. That's what we had over here. This string, cat, is before dog. And we got back the negative number, okay? Oh, it returns zero if they're the same. If you actually compared cat to cat, you'd get back zero because they're the same number. So if you compare a, a string to itself, you'll get back zero because if you have a number minus itself, you get zero, okay? And you get a positive number if this string is larger or comes later in the dictionary than the other string, okay? They, notice how many words it took to explain that. That's the most complicated of these methods. Of all these methods, this is the most complicated one. It needs the most word, and it's still kind of tricky to understand. Comparing strings is a tricky thing in programming languages. It's done in kind of this odd way. We need some way of getting an answer. And they was decided that the answer would be a positive or negative number, depending on what you're really asking is, of your two strings, which one is later in the dictionary? Which one is more like a bigger number? So they treat it as if you were saying this number minus that number, and you want to know if which one's bigger and larger. You want to know if you got a negative answer or a positive answer. Okay, very quirky, you know, but that's how you compare strings. Okay, all right. Now, the homework, let's go to the homework assignment. Your homework assignment is a question, is a problem about strings. And what you have to do is you have to like look at this table and ask where are there methods in here I can use to help me solve this problem. Now, what is the problem? Okay, go, let's go to the web page. Let's open the homework page. Okay. Oh, actually, I had it open already. Okay. The homework assignment is for you to use a scanner to read in somebody's typing a string. So your program will ask the user to enter a, a line of text. The user types in a line of text and you read it using a scanner. Then you're supposed to print this little message. I have rephrased what you, that line to read. You're supposed to take the first word of the sentence, move it to the end of the sentence, take the second word in the sentence and capitalize it. That's all, but it's a little bit tricky, but you have, to, and you have to think about what kind of, so this will be your string. You'll read this string from the user, and then you have to think about what string methods can you use to kind of chop this string up into pieces, and you need to find the first piece, put it at the end of the string, and you might need, and you'll need to put a space there, because this string probably doesn't have a space at the end. It may or may not have a space at the end. You need to put a space there. And then you have to take the second word that was in the string and change its first letter to be a capital letter. Okay, so it's a little puzzle. What methods can you use in the string class 
to cut to chop a string up into pieces you'll need like you'll need that piece of the string you'll need that piece of the string you'll end up reversing those two so that this piece of the string ends up at the end you probably actually need this piece of the string and this piece of the string as separate things because you got to take the i and turn it into a capital i so you actually really kind of need what you need one, two, three pieces of the string, and then you rearrange it. The I becomes capitalized. This just comes after the capital I, and then you have to take the, what was the first piece and put it at the end. Okay, so you start hunting over here for methods that could help you on this. And you do like we did over here, you build up a bunch of new variables. Build up new variables holding the different pieces that you do different things with them. And then at the end, you'll put the new string together. You can put the, now how do you put a string together? Okay, we've kind of seen that. Let me just show you real quickly. Suppose I have a string, uh, I'll call it S10. Suppose I have a string, I'll just make up a string. Um, here's a string. And I have another string, S11. Okay. How do I put these two strings together? They remember, we kind of seen it. It's been, you know, it, we haven't, we probably haven't used it in a couple of days. Does anybody remember, how do you put them together? I'm gonna give a name to the new thing. I wanna put them together in S12. What should S12 equal? S10 plus S11. Yeah, plus we use a plus symbol just like if you were adding numbers. Remember, you can you can put two strings together by adding them together. S10 plus S11. So after you've played around with strings and broken them up into pieces, like in this case, you know, after you've taken the string, broken it up into pieces, manipulated the pieces, you put it back together again by just adding up the pieces. Whoops, where did I, I lost my, okay. Adding up the piece. So let's see, let's see that, that this is just going to create a string that adds those two together. Now you'll see, I, something went wrong, something's not going to be great here. Okay, let me go to the end. Then we see, uh, what could I have done better? When I put the two strings together, what should I have probably have done? What do you think I probably wanted? A space between them. Between three and buckle, or between the two strings. Yeah, I probably wanted this. So I may need, you may need to do that. When you put things together, you might say, well, I actually also need a space here. So I'm actually adding three strings together. My S10 and my S11 with a space between them. So I can just tack the space inside there. And then that'll look better, okay? Okay, so so you can you can you can use methods to pull strings apart, and you can use methods to modify strings. Oh, what's the main tool for pulling strings apart? Same over here. What's your tool for pulling a string apart? What did I do over here? Look, you know, what? Substrings. Substring, yeah. Substrings, the tool to, to get a piece of a string. So in a sense that, now you never break a string apart because strings can never be changed. Strings actually can never be changed. But if you want a piece of a string, use substring. Okay, so if you take a string and you, if you pull several substrings out of it, you've broken the string into pieces. So you can pull several substrings out of a string to break it into pieces. 
and then you can use plus to put them back pieces back together again okay so substring will pull things up out into pieces uh, if you need to look for something in a string you use index of to find something in a string okay and you know what you have to do is you have you have a little puzzle to solve you know, you you've got to solve this little puzzle of you know, like you're gonna have to find the last word in the string somehow see i'm sorry you have to find the, i'm sorry you have to find the first word in the string okay so you have to find the first word in the string and pull it out yeah you know, now the, every string is different you know you don't know you know the first word in the string might be four letters long it might be 27 letters long it might be one letter long so you have to think about how you can find the first word in the string in a way that always works you can't just assume that the first word in the string is four letters okay so the first word in the string can be anything okay so you have to find a way of finding the first word in the string that'll always work for any string okay then you cut that out and make it its own variable then you have to cut out the rest of the string make it its own variable maybe you also need to cut out that part the very first letter by itself so you have to you have to break it up into pieces and then rearrange the pieces okay so that's what the homework assignment is and you will need to use these methods not all of them not by any means you probably only need three of them you may only need three or four of these methods okay Okay, okay. Notice that things like uh, two uppercase will change a lowercase letter to uppercase for you. Okay, so that's that's something that will change a lowercase letter. That's what will change a lowercase letter to an uppercase for you. If you pull this letter out by itself, you can two uppercase it to make it an uppercase letter. So that's why I was saying you need to. You probably need to break this off as one piece, break that off as another piece, the re and then another piece would be the rest. You know, you can turn this guy into a capital letter by on that piece calling to uppercase. Okay, so you'll need a few of these methods. You're not going to need compare to. We we did an example of compare to. Uh, uh, that's the one of the most complicated methods here. You you don't need to do any dictionary ordering in this homework assignment. So you're not going to be using compare to. But, you know, so you'll need to you, you'll have to sit down. You'll have to look at this list and think about which one of these you would need to use. Okay. You can use any one you want. You can use anything in this list that you think is helpful. Okay. Anything in this list that you think is helpful, you can go ahead and use it. Okay. Anybody got questions? You want to you want to read this real carefully. Probably after reading this and thinking about it, you may end up with questions. So so go ahead and 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 you know download this, start reading it, thinking about it. As you think about it, you if you come up with questions, send me an email or or, or you know ask for a meeting or whatever. But you, know, you have to start thinking about this stuff. Yeah, you, know, you have to you uh, you have to read it and think about it. There's it's not a trivial thing. You're not it's not going to be something that writes itself. You're going to have to really think about a strategy of pulling apart a string and then reassembling the string in a different way. Okay? So you have to you know you have to think what what can let me what can what can I use over here to pull it apart and reassemble it? Pulling apart mostly substring, reassembling usually pluses. Okay. Substring to break things into pieces. Addition to just put things back together again. Maybe you need to put a little space between them or not. You'll see. Maybe maybe not. When you pull out a piece, make sure you save it. You have to remember, you know, every time you pull out a substring, you've got to save it. But then these are the pieces that you would reassemble down later on. Okay. All right. So that's the homework assignment, real roughly. Yeah, and you got time. Yeah, yeah. That's a, a first pass at the homework assignment. So read it and think about it, and then you'll probably come up with more questions. Okay, now, 
if you read this section, they explain some, it's many of the things we just did, they, you know, length, substring, index of, we talked about those. They do, make sure you go through these code, these examples, answer their questions, think about these examples. There's the compare to, we didn't talk about equals yet. You can ask if two strings are equal or not. Sometimes you wanna know if, if two strings are the same. Now actually compare to will do that. If compare to returns zero, the two strings are equal. But there's actually a separate equal equals method and a compare to method. Compare to actually does a little bit more than equals. Equals gives you back true or false to tell you whether they're equal or not. Compare to, if it gives you back zero, they're equal. So when compare to returns zero, they're equal. Sometimes you want it, sometimes you just care if they're equal or not. Sometimes you want to know what their alphabetical, their, their dictionary ordering is. So compare to and equal are closely related, but not quite the same thing. Okay. And there, notice that they have a lot, they give you lots of things to think about. They they're using these examples. They're 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 talking about these two methods and you know, they give you a lot more examples than we can talk about in class. So they, you, they want you to think about these different examples here. And then they have, here's a little section on some things you can do. What are the kind of things you are more likely to make as mistakes with strings? Okay. Let's look at what, let's see what, let's look at what kind of examples. Okay. Here's a list of common mistakes. For, whoops, I forget what, what did I do there? Okay. The substring, remember, substring doesn't include the last index. If you ask for the substring between three and seven, you're not going to get the letter at index seven. You get the letter up to index six. So that's a common mistake, forgetting that uh, substring doesn't include the last letter. Here's an important one. Thinking that strings can change. Yeah, see, there's the word. They're immutable. They never change. So it's a real common mistake. You know, you you strings never change. Every time you ask a string to make a change, you got to you have to catch the answer in a new variable because the string itself isn't changing like turtles change. Okay. Oh, this is here. We didn't do this. What happens if you go past the end of a string? So let's do that. Let's do what. That's a real common mistake. Let's go over here. Let's do something that would go off the end of a string, okay? I'll just do that down here, okay? What if I ask for in um, S2, S2 dot, what's the character at index 1005? Okay, is there a character at 1005? The string's only got about 10 letters in it. So this is going way off the end of the string, okay? What happens if you go way off the end of a string? Okay, my program blew up, okay? I'm about to do this line 28. And what happens is my program actually blows up. Here, oh, let me show you what I mean by blow up. I'm supposed to get an answer from there. The answer should be a care C2 equals the care at location 1,500. And suppose I wanna print my answer. My program will never get to line 29 because it blows up at line 28. My program will not execute line 29. It blows up at line 28 because I'm doing some, I'm going off the end of a string. And when, when you do something that's not allowed, a Java program is halted. So if I visualize this, I'm stepping through the program and I get to this line that's gonna blow up the program. 
I click the forward button and notice that it did not move forward. The forward button is grayed out. My program has halted because I did something illegal. I got a string index out of bounds exception. Exception, exception means you did something illegal. That halts the program. You see that because the forward button is grayed out. You see that the program did not advance to the next line and I cannot even execute line 29 of my program. My program is just dead because I did a mistake, okay? So that's one of their warnings here, okay? Trying to access part of a string, not between index zero and length minus one. The last index in a string is it's because you count from zero. If a string has nine characters, the last index is eight. So that's length minus one. So the only indexes you can use are between zero and length minus one. If you use any other index, if you use any other index, your program blows up. So if I here I clearly used an index that isn't allowed, okay, and my program blows up. If I use the negative index there, so there's a negative index. Not allowed. There's no negative indexes in strings. The string doesn't have a character at position negative one. The positions start counting at zero, okay? So you can't, you can't have an index less than zero, and you can't have an index more than length minus one. Okay. So they warn you about some little things here. They warn you about uh, things that you should be aware of that you'll, you'll, you'll make these mistakes. Probably everybody makes these mistakes. Everybody, when they're starting out, makes these. That's why they want you to, they, they kind of, they talk about these common mistakes because everybody makes them. So once you've been warned, you know, forewarned, you know, you know, they want you to, they want to warn you so you kind of look out for these kinds of things. Okay, now let's, let's look at something else. Let's look at another idea. Um, well, actually, in the reading assignment, we've actually now finished 2.6 and 2.7. There's a real short section here called the math. Now, this section is just a summary. So we're not going to talk about that. Yeah, you know, I think you should look at it, but it's a summary. There's something called the math class. Okay. This is a little bit of a tricky idea. Okay, we've got let me write a bit of code. And I'm gonna write it in Dr. Java this time. Because I want to write, yeah, I'm gonna write it in Dr. Java. Okay, I'm going to create a call. The disadvantage of using Dr. Java is I got to type all this stuff to get started. Okay, there's my bare bones little program. I save it on my desktop. Okay. Create a, I'm going to create a turtle. I'm going to call him T to be real creative. Oh, actually, I have before I can create a turtle, I have to create a world. I'll create a small world. And then I can put the turtle in the small world. Okay, now I can tell the turtle to move forward. Okay, I'm calling a method on the turtle, and that makes the turtle change himself a little bit. Okay, now I'm going to create a string s equal. Okay, there's a string. I can call a method on that string. Okay. 
Now, okay, that changed the turtle. This will not change the string. So we see something different. Now, what's common is I'm calling a method on an object. I'm calling a method on an object. This method will change that object. This method won't change that object. So if I want that answer, I better do something like Okay, All right. So I see I'm I'm seeing kind of uh, things that are alike and things that are different. Now I'm going to call another method. Okay, here's a number. That's not an object. That's just a number. Okay, I want the square. I want the. Uh, I want to. Um, I want to do a math. I want to do a little bit of math with this bump. Yeah. So on your calculator, you have buttons like logarithm, sine, cosine. Okay, here's how I would compute the cosine of that number. I, co I say math dot cosine of x. I'm calling a method, but not on an object. Now, this is this new section of the book. This is uh, in the reading. This is called the math class, section 2.9, okay? So this is another kind of method. These are methods that aren't called on objects. We call them static methods. And actually, these are the kind of methods we started with. These are the methods we were talking about in the other book. These are the methods that are not on an object. These are the methods that just sort of sit by themselves. So this thing, computes the cosine of that number and it gives me back an answer and if i want to remember the answer it's a little bit like a uh, substring if i want to remember the answer i need to hold another variable to hold that answer okay right and then if i want to see the answer since i'm in uh, i'm not in the visualizer i need to print it out okay now i can compile this Now, if I run it, I create a, a, a turtle world. That'll be off to the side. I'll create a string. Okay. Oh, let me go ahead and print this sub. Uh, and I'll. If I want to see the answer, since I'm not in the visualizer, I need to print out that answer. Oh, what did I do wrong? Misspelled system. Okay, now let me run it. Okay, there's my little turtle world. There is uh, my substring was, uh, the substring was from the letter A and D space D of dog. And then there's the cosine of 12.3. That's this number here. That's the cosine of 12. Now notice I've got three kinds of things going on. A method on an object that changes the object a method on an object that doesn't change the object, and a method in a class, a static method. There's no object here, a method in a class. So and this is static method in uh, the way we say it, it's a static method in a class this is a method in an object this is another method in an object this one changes the object this one does not change the object so we better capture the answer and this one is giving us an answer but there's no object to change or not. There's no object. See, notice how this is capital M. That's the symbol, that's the thing that that's the thing that tells you it's a static method in the in the math class. Okay. So Java has several different kinds of methods. Several, there's lots going on here. 
methods and objects and methods and static methods in classes. Methods and objects might modify the object. They might not modify the object. And when you have a method in a class, there's no object to be modified. You just have this, this the class is just something that organizes a bunch of methods. So the math class has all the things you have buttons for on your calculator. So everything you have a button for on your calculator, there's a method in the math class. For example, there's a LN button for logarithm, and there's gonna be a sine button and a tangent button and a cotangent button. And uh, if you wanna raise up, if you wanna, there's a power button so I can get X cubed, I need two numbers now. That's x to the y in a sense. So I have the base and the exponent. So there's a power function that raises this number to that power. So everything you have a button for on your calculator, excuse me, everything you have a button for on your calculator, there's a method in the math class for it also. The key idea here though is not so much that we want to do math functions. You know, we're not going to use the, the, the log, we're never going to use the logarithm function in this class. What is, is we want to point out that there's these other kinds of methods. There's methods that are in a class that aren't methods on an object. Okay, now the thing here. If I go down here and change this to okay, am I caught? Yeah, this is kind of a, um. Well, S and make this T. Okay, I'm calling this method on that object. I'm calling this method on a different object. I'm giving them the same parameters, but I'm calling the method on different objects so I get different answers. Because that's this method on this object, that's this method on the, a different object. These methods don't have an object over here. You, you can't call ln on different things. You can give it different parameters, but you can't, there's only one ln function. It's the ln function in math. Over here, in a sense, I have two different substring methods. I have the substring that's lit, that's sitting inside S and the substring that's sitting inside of T, okay? That's, remember we drew pictures, we said that these, uh, it, uh, if, you, if you go back to the book, if you go to the book and you go to, section 2.4, there's this picture of what an object looks like. And remember, the object holds attributes and methods. We think of these methods as sitting in a turtle object. A turtle holds this data, and these methods act on that data. So one turtle's forward method acts on that turtle's x and y coordinate. If there's another turtle over here, its forward method acts on x axis and y coordinates. So here, this string holds some data. It holds that data. That method acts on that data. This same method doesn't act on that data. This method acts on that data because I called it on that object. So even though I gave, I'm calling the same method with the same parameters, I get back different answers because there's different methods. There's different objects there. Okay, so we've got methods in an object. In this case, a method that changes the object. Method in an object, and I can put it in a site that changes the object. Okay, we have methods in an object that don't change the object. That's what st the string methods do. And then there's static methods in a class that don't have an object involved, okay? So the point of section 2.9 is really 
a little bit to introduce you to the math functions, because every once in a while you do need them. Every once in a while you might need a math function, but also just to point out that there's this other kind of method in Java, which is the methods we worked with in chapter four of the other book. When we wrote our own methods in chapter four, we actually were writing the static methods. We were writing static methods, okay? So we have two fundamentally different kinds of methods, methods that act on objects and methods that are static that don't act on objects. Then among the methods that act on objects, there's also two slightly different cases, methods that change the object and methods that cannot change the object, objects that never change and objects that do change. So there's a lot of little ideas going on. There's a lot, of, you know, it, and that's the last thing in this in this chapter was just pointing out that there there are these methods that are static. And the, the most famous example of them are the math methods in the math class. But we also did those in chapter four of the other book. We wrote our own static methods, and we're going to go back to that. We're going to start writing our own methods again. We're going to go back to writing our own methods. Instead of calling somebody else's methods on objects, we're going to go back to writing our own methods. Okay, so we kind of go back and forth. We learn to use methods that other people wrote for us, and we learn to write our own methods. Your, your, new, your current program assignment, you're using the methods that somebody else wrote. And then following homework assignment after that, you're going to be back to writing a method yourself. Okay, so we're going to kind of go back and forth. Actually, you haven't had a homework where you have to write your own method yet. I don't know, let's see. What was, uh, I, I, did, did you write, was, I, I actually forgot now. What about homework assignment two? Oh, that, yeah, you did not write, yeah. You have not had a homework assignment yet where you wrote your own methods. That'll be assignment four Well, you'll, Assignment three is you're using other people's methods. You're using methods in the string class and in the scanner. You're going to use a, a couple methods in scanner and some methods in string. And then assignment four, when that comes along, that'll be you're going to write your own method, but you'll be writing a static method, you'll, you'll, we'll, which is what we did in chapter four of the other book. Okay, so we've gone over. Uh, anybody got any last minute question? Anybody have a question they want to ask? Uh, I got a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, for the homework, do you want us to anticipate any sentence being put into it or the one no, that any you have sentence. on there? Yeah. Any no, sentence? no, no. That's the good point. No, your your assignment has to be ready for any sentence that somebody puts in there. So that's why I was saying that you can't assume that the first word is four letters. You, you know, I could give you any sentence. And if you look in the homework assignment, there are test cases. See, the job is the language. Here's another test case. And if you read the homework assignment, your program should work with these various test cases. So here's a whole bunch of different test cases. See, in this test case, actually, I made the mistake of having every test case begin, everyone but one began with a word with four letters at the front. I should change that. But notice that this test case, the first word is just the letter A. No, but your program has to work, and this is, you know, and I will test your homework with more test cases than this. So I give you some test cases that you should make sure that work, your, your program should work on these test cases, and I'll test your program with lots of other test cases. So your program, this is always the case when you write programs, your program should work for any input. You're asking the user to type in something, your program should work no matter what they choose to type in. So your program should do the right thing no matter what the user types in, okay? All right, so your, your program is not gonna just assume that it's getting this input. That would be too easy if it was gonna assume it always had that input. And your program can't assume that it gets just these five inputs. You know, I've got five test cases here. I'm just giving you five test cases for you to make sure that you can, you know, you should be able to do those, but you should make up your own test cases. Any sentence, the user can type in anything they want. When, when you give them the prompt, your program has to work properly with their, them typing in anything. Okay, so that's real important. Your program should work for anything the user types there. Okay, what about other questions? Okay, 
read the homework assignment real carefully, think about it, and then and then if you have more questions, send me emails about them. Okay. Um, I think we're done. Okay, we've got we're five minutes over. So I'll go ahead. There's no more questions. I'm going to stop sharing, and I'll go ahead and end the meeting. And we'll meet again on Tuesday. So have a nice weekend. Bye.